Well, how's that for a Gemini Aston Villa performance? Great, exhilarating first half. Not the greatest second half. Wonderful going forward. Fantastic. Not so good defending. This time we took a two goal lead. Last time we came from two goals down. I mean, this is Aston Villa. We're up, we're down. We're just not allowed to have nice things yet. The thing I feel in the end, though, is it's an opportunity missed. I mean, we had a two goal lead at home, closing in on halftime and Leeds United, a team that ships an awful lot of goals without some of their key players. So I, I wanted to introduce you to a very Gemini like whiskey. This is proper Canadian whiskey. This is as Canadian as freedom loving truck drivers. It's called Alberta Premium Rye and it's cask strength strong. 65 proof. Oh, so strong, but yet subtle. It's sweet and yet still a little bit salty. The perfect kind of whiskey to enjoy as we review Aston Villa 3, Leeds United 3. Welcome inside the Villa Parlor. It feels like it's been a long time. And if I may, to either new or existing Aston Villa fans, no matter how long your tenure has been, may I offer some advice? Just lower your expectations. That way, you'll never be disappointed. And you might have the odd surprise like, oh, I don't know, a 7-2 thumping of Liverpool. And this is especially true after international windows or winter breaks. In fact, Aston Villa's best performances, the best, most optimistic feelings around the club always precede those breaks. And so if you just lower or temper your expectations, you'll never be disappointed. And this is also true with players. Oh, we love to pump up our players. Case in point, Emmy Buendia, Mr. January, January's player of the month, called up by Argentina and then made his debut for his country during the window. We're all thinking the guy's on fire right now, scored the winning goal against Everton. Masterclass incoming. No. We saw September Emmy Buendia against Leeds, a player who as hard as he tried could not connect with his teammates. This is why we just lower our expectations and have lots of this handy. Let's crack on then with the Holy Trinity, the three big issues or moments that defined Villa 3 leads three, starting with the key statistics in a game that saw the visitors take 61% of the possession. Maybe that's not a surprise. Villa decent in some of the other areas, including expected goals. More than two to one duels won. 38 were on the ground, 14 in the air. Past success percentage poor again for Villa at home. Accurate crosses, though, five, which was 33% rate. Maddie Cash two for two, Luca Dean only one for seven, and nine successful dribbles. When you look at successful dribbles, accurate crosses, and the duels won, it kind of looks like Villa won a lot of the little battles without winning the ultimate war. Easily the most demoralizing game last year was when Leeds came to Villa Park and battered us 3-0. And that was on the back of four on the spin to start the year for Aston Villa. What a sobering, crushing, momentum-killing moment that was. And I saw elements of that game on Wednesday because Leeds is so good at drawing opposition players in, then playing around them and attacking the wide areas. The problem for Leeds is they're so leaky at the back. Only Norwich and Newcastle have conceded more goals and they're missing guys like Patrick Bamford and Calvin Phillips. So I feel like this was an opportunity missed for Aston Villa. As it stands right now, Leeds is a bottom six side. Honorable mention number one was the first half refereeing performance by Australian Jared Gallette, who just said, play on, boys. And two teams that were willing to go forward and go hammer and tongs obliged. You know, they figured it out. Incidental softish contact play on because I'm not calling it. And that made for one of the 
best first halves or halves of football at Villa Park I've seen in a very, very long time. In fact, it probably resembled the helter-skelter style of football that we would have seen 18 years ago, which was the last time Leeds and Villa played at Villa Park with supporters in it. But that third goal was a direct result of a very good advantage. You could even argue two advantages because there was two moments of contact in that sequence. He looked up, saw the open field and said, on you go. He could have always called it back, but that was a moment of very high game IQ. And I wish more referees had it. I wish more VAR officials had it. And I just wonder why ex-pros never get into refereeing. Like, yeah, they're older, but they read the game. Well, that was a great example of reading the game right there. And predictably in the second half, they were never, ever going to sustain that level of intensity. The whistle came out more, the cards came out more, and there was just more stop start because of all the injuries. Honorable mention number two, Luca Dean had an incredible chance to restore Villa's two goal lead right at the end of the first half. And listen, I get it after 45 minutes like that. Players are mentally and physically shattered. It's their first meaningful game in an extended period. You can forgive a player for not expecting that chance to pop up when it does. But when it did, it looked like he kind of chose the wrong option. He tries to hit it with the outside of his left foot rather than maybe just using his right footed instep to guide it into the corner. Easy for me to say. And I also wonder if he's got this internal clock ticking down in his head, the added time clock, and he maybe just snatched at it a little bit. But that would have been the number one moment of the game if he had buried that because it would have been devastating to Leeds. And honorable mention number three. Can someone please remind Ezri Konza that he's Ezri Konza? Has he been unsettled by the arrival of Callum Chambers? Because he's now opened the door wide open for him to come in and take his spot. And it wasn't just how he shaped up on the goal where he literally allowed Daniel James to shoot through the wickets, the way he positioned himself. He wasn't switched on there at all. And it wasn't the brain dead decision while on a yellow card to put his arm up on Melier and try to block him off. It was his overall play so tentative on the ball. And this is concerning because we've seen his trajectory over the last two years. It's been going this way. Number three, Mingen. Oh, Tyrone Mings had a tough, tough day at the office. And I just wonder, after seeing Steven Gerrard's expression after the 1-0 and the 3-3 goals, just how much higher up the priority list is that particular position to address in the summer. And it's not just those moments and how all those little mistakes seem to always wind up in the back of his goal. It's the distribution out of the back sometimes, the confidence to play the ball between players. And I'm saying this because that was really obvious in the first 15 minutes, but then later in the game, he's driving forward and joining the attack, including on that chance I mentioned earlier from Luca Dean. In fact, he started the chance by driving down the left-hand side. We have to stop with this. Are you or are you not on board with Tyrone Mings? We are an ambitious club now with wealthy, resourceful owners. They're there is not a position on the field or a player in that squad who is not upgradable. And to suggest at this stage, even as club captain, that Tyrone Mings is somehow above being upgraded is frankly preposterous. And we know damn well that he's going to be starting on Sunday at Newcastle, probably alongside Callum Chambers. And this is part of the problem. There's this almost obligation to start him because there really isn't anybody else. But if you did bring in another alpha dog center back, maybe a footballing center back, then maybe Tyrone Mings would be forced to simplifying his game and getting back to the player that joined Villa in the first place and help them get promoted. The one who was called up to England on numerous occasions and helped them earn clean sheets. That's meat and potatoes. Great positioning, great communication. Block balls off the lines like we saw in the game. Aerial duels, blocks, all those things. Maybe once in a while would it kill him to actually hit the target on an attacking corner? How about that one in the first half? Holy smokes. But my point is this, if he's being challenged, it would force him potentially to rethink his game. Right now, I think he's trying to be something that he's not, and it's hurting him week in and week out. Specifically on that first goal, which is a big goal because it's only 10 minutes in at home after an extended break, 
He simply does not deal with it. He doesn't deal with the ball through. He loses a duel at the edge of his own penalty area. It's as if he's trapped in between wanting to either clear his lines without consequence, make it ugly, don't worry about aesthetics, and thinking that he has to win a duel there to launch an attack. And that is the dichotomy of Tyrone Mings, very similar to Aston Villa, as I talked about the Gemini Club, the two sides. One minute, Tyrone Mings saves a goal by blocking it on the goal line. One minute later, he's not balanced on his feet. He can't clear the ball and it's into the back of the net. One minute, he's running up the field and he passes a ball straight into touch. The next, he's rampaging forward and nearly setting up the ball for Luca Dean that I just alluded to a few moments earlier. Number two, the little magician. The thing that will haunt me about this game is that we wasted an absolutely virtuoso performance by Philip Coutinho. And you know, one other time in the Premier League, he scored once and assisted on two others. So statistically, that's not easy to do. And he's gone and done it at the age of 31. The talent this guy has, the reason why he's so good is he instantly sees the pictures, clocks it right away, just needs a glance. And then he has the craft to deliver the ball. And when Aston Villa finally learned that they could play a little bit more direct to bypass the Leeds press, well, this was his wheelhouse. I mean, he's doing this in about 15 minutes. The damage he does is unbelievable. The goal, superbly, surgically taken. What a ball by Matty Cash, by the way. If only he could do this more often. Well, what a week carries off to Atletico Madrid. But this is almost a set-piece goal. It's a throw, one pass, and then I didn't think Cash was getting around on it but what a ball what a finish and that was just the start the split ball for Ramsey is absolutely perfect he has one glance before he lays it on a platter and we have to also give credit to Jacob Ramsey JJ for becoming that player that this club has needed for such a long time every club needs a midfielder like this the one that knows when to release and become the third man in or that extra overloading forward and that is what he is seeing now and the two of them are starting to understand one another. They've combined for four goals already between them and long may that continue. And then the 3-1 goal was just about delaying. He's so comfortable, even in traffic, just taking that little pocket of space, surveying, surveying. Everybody in blue is afraid to close him down. And in that time, a teammate makes a fantastic run, which I'll talk about in just a second. And when that happens, it opens up and all he has to do is switch it and play it into a path for Ramsey again. And just on that goal, I want to point out why Ollie Watkins is so valuable in this system and why he's combining so well, even if he isn't scoring. I cannot believe what I'm reading on Twitter. I'm just like, nobody understands what a number nine needs to do. It is not just about scoring goals. And on the goal, watch as he drags the Leeds defender completely over with him because he makes the right run. And that rolls out the red carpet for Jacob Ramsey to run into. Ollie Watkins, I thought, was going to get the return pass from Ramsey for a tap in. Ramsey's too confident right now. He smashes it in, no problem. But Watkins does all the work, in addition to, by the way, creating three chances. Most out of anybody on the field. And yet everybody's saying, well, he's lazy. There's something wrong with him on all this stuff. It drives me nuts. But back to the original point on Philip Coutinho. He's a game changer. Aston Villa need to do everything they can to lock this guy down for a couple of more years in the summer. And can we please start to just let him take free kicks in dangerous areas around the box? I mean, even by Austin McPhee's standard, that 51st minute free kick was just a little bit too avant-garde. And the Holy Trinity's number one big issue or moment that defined Villa 3 leads 3, the 3-2 three, goal. Oh, the 3-2 goal. Were you thinking it just before then? The euphoria, the adrenaline, the exhilaration of what was happening. You were thinking it. I know you were. How much, how many? Leeds is leaky. That goalkeeper has allowed more goals than any other in the Premier League this season. Can we get a hat trick for JJ? Can Ollie Watkins get off the schneid? I know all those things were going through people's heads. But I've been in the game a long time. I've coached a lot. The voice inside my head, the pragmatic one, was screaming at me, the next goal is critical. And you absolutely cannot allow it in first half stoppage time. Heck, you might have been thinking the same thing watching from the television or the terraces, wherever you were watching it from. 
and they allowed it. And so it doesn't matter what the run of play looked like. Leeds could have been up 2-0 quite easily. Hitting the crossbar, Daniel James. I mean, Villa was lucky they weren't down two or maybe even three and how that might have changed the psychology of the game. But none of that matters. The deserves, the what ifs, none of that. When you have a 3-1 lead, you got to take it to the locker room because the difference psychologically between 3-1 and 3-2 for both managers' team talks is stark. And then this happens. And by my count, that's nine Aston Villa players in their own penalty area, not including Emmy Martinez. And when the ball is deflected and looped over, there are six Villa players in their own six yard box facing their own goal. And the two Leeds players cause enough problems for it to go in. I just don't understand the plan and why Emmy Buendia, the shortest guy in the field, is the one who ultimately is challenging for the ball under the shadow of his crossbar. And here's another personal pet peeve. But in my opinion, if you can't block it outright and snuff it out, let it go. Because when you deflect it, you cause more problems. You change the trajectory, the speed of the ball. And it happened twice. Happened here. And John McGinn deflected the corner that led to the 3-3 goal. Again, I'm sure that's a factor in it. Let it go. The keeper's clocked it. The center back has clocked it. Don't change the angle of the cross at the last second. You have to understand the circumstances at the time. And I really wish Aston Villa had approached the final few moments of first half stoppage time the way they approached those eight minutes of second half stoppage time, which was conservative, almost to the point of paranoia, to the point of kind of time killy a little bit. And you also have to go back 30 seconds before the goal and saw what led up to that chance for Leeds because Villa had a good spell of possession going in its own third. Leeds couldn't catch them with their press. They were probably tired. Villa was working it around from one side to the other. It comes out to Matty Cash and he plays a hopeful ball in the direction of Ollie Watkins. I don't know if Watkins wasn't expecting it. Usually he's pretty good. 1v2, 1v3, reeling those in, holding them up. But on this occasion, he didn't get there. And from that moment, the ball goes back into Villa's third and it's three to two. And Villa need to learn from these moments if they're seriously going to climb up the table. We'll close with the subcategories we're watching all season long, including the record at Villa Park. Two draws in a row means they're now 15 out of a possible 33 points. Austin McPhee set pieces took a hit with the concession of the 3-3 goal from a corner. And Leeds is in the bottom six when Villa have played bottom six teams. At that time, they've earned 11 out of a possible 18 points. <laughs> Newcastle is not going to be easy. They're not bad at home. They've got a little run going. Alain Saint Maximum seems to be unplayable at the moment. No Ezri Kanza. Let's see about Emi Buendia and hopefully Philip Coutinho's feeling okay as well. I'm just going to watch the Jacob Ramsey goals over and over and over until then. And until then, as always, stay well and up the mighty villa. 